name is Jerry Barakos, and I'm here with my esteemed colleague, Dr. Tammy Benzinger. I'd like to start by extending a warm welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us. We'll be discussing the topic of ARIA, amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. I'd like to thank Peerview for providing the session and Lily for providing the educational grant for this symposium. Please keep in mind that we'll have polling questions coming up during the presentation, so please respond to those. And feel free to submit your questions into the chat box and we'll answer them during the presentation. Now, remember to come visit us at peerview.com. These slides, as well as additional practice aids, will be available for download and for use. And we're at peerview.com. Now, let's start by looking at this FDA bulletin. Basically, imperative for radiologists and neuroradiology specialists to be prepared for rapidly emerging era of patients initiating treatment with anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies for the treatment of early stage Alzheimer's disease. Now, these agents, FDA approved agents, contain a black box warning. And I just wanted to give a little bit of background as to what this is addressing. As many of you know, these are exciting times in the field of Alzheimer's disease, as these new anti-amyloid agents are the first disease-modifying tools we have to address Alzheimer's disease. And this is just the start, as many additional drugs are in the pipeline. So what does this mean to us as radiologists? Not only is this a great advance in science, but it also provides us as radiologists, a unique opportunity as we play a crucial role in the use of these therapies, as we'll be discussing here today. Because it turns out these therapies are imaging intensive as patients must undergo MR imaging prior to the initiation of therapy to ensure they are qualified for treatment and do not have any exclusionary findings. And once treatment is initiated, the patients must undergo routine surveillance scans to monitor for potential disease complications. Our findings on these scans, on every and each one of these MRI scans, will be critical information that must be relayed to the treating physicians since the drug dose and therapy will be modified depending on what we find. So in brief, we as radiologists play a vital role in this major advance. Now, let's take a look at our goals for today, is to equip you with the skills needed to detect and monitor these findings, which are called amyloid-related imaging abnormalities as these represent changes that may occur on patients who are being treated with these new anti-amyloid agents. At the same time, we want to improve your ability to utilize ARIA reporting templates, which Dr. Benzinger will go over in detail, to provide clear communication with the team caring for these patients. Now, when we look at the incidence of these amyloid-related imaging changes, they vary with different monoclonal antibodies. The incidence for the ARIA-E type, remember we have ARIA-E and ARIA-H. E refers to the edematous form of this process, where there's edema in the brain tissue or leptomeningeal effusions. The H form refers to the hemosiderin aspect of these potential changes, and those manifest as lobar microhemorrhages or superficial leptomeningeal siderosis. The incidence for RAE can range from as low as 1% to up to 40% of patients receiving these agents. The ARIA-H form can range from about 1% to about 28%. Here's a key point. As you see in the slide, 74 to 89% of ARIA is asymptomatic. This is critical. So in other words, the vast majority of these imaging changes are asymptomatic. These changes will be taking place in the patient's brain and they'll manifest no clinical symptomatology. That is why imaging is critical. So routine surveillance imaging is performed as the patient is being given drugs over the many months or years of treatment. And if there are abnormalities that develop, we as the radiologists must communicate those abnormalities to the clinicians so they can adjust dosage or suspend treatment until these findings stabilize or resolve. Now, not only is the majority of ARIA asymptomatic, when it is symptomatic, the majority of symptoms are either mild to moderate. So we can see bullet point number four, only about 4% of the symptomatic ARIA was deemed clinically severe. 
What are the risk factors for ARIA, for developing this condition of ARIA, when you're being treated with these anti-amyloid agents in the treatment of mild Alzheimer's disease? The main risk factor is the number of copies of the ApoE4 allele you carry. Number two is the dose of agent. Obviously, in all situations, the more dose, the more likelihood of complications. The other thing we note is that these ARIA complications occur most commonly in the early phases of treatment. So the majority of ARIA occurs within the first seven doses. Another risk factor is the presence of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And this is specifically what we're screening for before a patient enters treatment. As you know, cerebral amyloid angiopathy is a condition in which there's significant amyloid deposition within the brain and the vasculature. If you have cerebral amyloid angiopathy, that means when we start to remove the amyloid from the vasculature, there'll be a very high likelihood of ARIA. The hypothesized pathophysiology of ARIA. As I alluded to, when we remove the amyloid from the vasculature, there's a transient phase of increased vascular permeability. And this is where fluid or red blood cells can leak out. Now, in this lineup of examples, we're looking at our first image, which is the baseline T2 flare image, and we're centered high in the frontal parietal convexity. This was before treatment. Um, the patient underwent therapy, was undergoing therapy, and on a follow-up routine surveillance scan, this patient had no symptoms, they simply came in for routine surveillance, we can see this red circle demonstrating an area of increased signal on the T2 flare on the high left frontal lobe. This is consistent with some edema within the brain parenchyma, as well as a little bit of a sulcal effusion. So this would be characteristic of fluid leaking out of the vasculature, and this is an imaging-related abnormality, and this would be called ARIA-E. The E form is this represents edema and or effusion. Now, this process is just like vasogenic edema. It's a transient process and resolves without sequelae. So we can see on the patient's one-month post-treatment follow-up scan, there's been complete resolution of this finding. So that is an important point about ARIA-E that we will be discussing in greater detail. Namely, it basically is a transient process, has no associated cytotoxic component. As a result, your diffusion-weighted scan will be negative. These findings of ARIA can mimic other abnormalities, such as subarachnoid hemorrhage or an acute infarct, but using other imaging sequences, such as the diffusion-weighted scan, will afford us the ability to determine that this is, in fact, an incidental finding relating to the ARIA and is not a pathologic process, um, specifically such as a stroke or a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Benzinger to discuss the actual imaging protocols that are used to evaluate for ARIA. Thank you, Dr. Baracus. What a great introduction to such an important topic. A really important thing to consider when we're talking about ARIA is we need to be able to get consistent results from scan to scan. One of the most important things to consider is going to be the imaging protocol that's acquired. As radiologist and neuroradiologist, I think we all know what a difference a scanner, a vendor, a field strength can make. Um, and so I think it's important as we think about what was acquired in clinical trials versus what's available in clinical practice, how we can standardize that. So um, obviously the field strength is important and the trials were really performed mostly at three Tesla. Um, but if your practice has mostly 1.5 T scanners, then it may be a practical choice that you end up doing this at 1.5 T, in which case um, you need to be consistent as well. You need to think carefully about the slice thickness Obviously, if you have thinner slices, you might see smaller findings, um, but you have to be concerned about the signal to noise and the timing with that. Um, there's probably the, the most important thing to be consistent with is going to be the way that we detect the micro hemorrhages. And so, you know, there are different techniques for doing this. We have our traditional T2 star type techniques, or we have more modern techniques such as susceptibility imaging, SWI, or SWAN on other platforms. Um, 
And finally, we use the flare for the edema and effusions, and we use diffusion for that recommended differential diagnosis. Um, in order to help with this, the American Society for Neuroradiology has done a project with Siemens, GE, and Philips to set about some standard protocols at 3T and 1.5T. And in your materials will be the links to go to that ASNR website. So you can download those protocols directly for your scanner to make that a little bit easier for you. So let's get into the details as well. So not just that we recommend that 3T scanner, but we actually recommend that you make this a specific orderable. So the way we've done this at Washington University is we've actually built an order. So instead of just saying brain MRI, when a neurologist is working up a patient for dementia, considering them for a monoclonal antibody therapy, they have a specific order that they place. And for us, we have two different names for it. It's the same protocol. We either call it brain volumetric because it's our 3D protocol, um, or they call it brain cognitive impairment, which is a little bit easier for some of our um, primary practice neurologists to understand. The key is anytime this gets ordered, it drives the patient to a 3T scanner. It drives them to a protocol that has the quality of the images that are recommended. So in this case, we're doing a 3D T1, a 3D flare. Um, we're doing both. SWI and T2 star, so that if they go to other scanners in the future, we've got a really good comparison of the modality techniques within it. Um, within that, it also drives specific reporting. So we're going to specifically count microhemorrhages, specifically count even lacunar infarcts, small infarcts. In our practice, we're grading the white matter hyperintensities. It makes it really helpful for the neurologist to have something concrete like a Fazekas scale. Um, and we have a specific dictation template. It's actually driven by this orderable. It opens up for us automatically. Um, and it's important to remember this order could be coming from our dementia clinic, our dementia specialist, but in order to streamline the flow of patients, we're also seeing now um, primary care, general neurologists, our geriatricians are all now trying to tee up their patients for potential therapy. And so these orders are coming from a number of groups. And so we try to make it really straightforward for them to order the right protocol so that if they do go on therapy later, we don't have to repeat that brain MRI. So some key findings that we need to report. So obviously we include all of the normal elements of our report. Um, do they have infarcts? Do we think they have vascular dementia? Do we see other findings? The things though that we really need to explicitly call out that you may not be doing on every brain MRI that's a general protocol is again, hemorrhages, if it's more than 10 millimeters, that's called a, a macro hemorrhage on this scale. You need to call those out explicitly. Micros, micro hemorrhages, right? There's these annoying little things. They're hard to count. They really do matter. And in particular, that the key breakdown on that baseline is if they have five or more, that's a contraindication to therapies with many of these medications. And so it's really important that you look at that carefully and comment on it. Similarly, Superficial siderosis. If they've had subarachnoid hemorrhage in the past, that puts them at higher risk for hemorrhages when they go on these therapies. And obviously, they have active findings of vasogenic edema. That's important to report. Um, the other things that are called out on the FDA labels, um, obviously, we would be talking about this as well. Things like aneurysms, if you see one, you don't need to run a protocol specific for them. But if you saw it or you knew they had it, you should say that. Same thing with vascular malformations, AVMs, the idea being they may have other reasons that they would get brain hemorrhages. Um, infarcts, both small and large, are also really important for us to present. Um, multiple MRIs are recommended, and these come at a schedule with a specific schedule for each drug advised, and you can see that on the label. But very common for someone to have four or five MRIs as they're going through the course of their first few weeks or months of therapy. Now, symptoms of ARIA, 
headache, confusion, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, blurry vision, gait disturbance, or seizure, rarely. These are not very specific symptoms. And in a population of elderly patients who already have mild cognitive impairment due to early Alzheimer disease, these can be pretty common. These symptoms will actually trigger additional MRI visits. Now, there's a grading scale the neurologists are using for the severity of the symptoms, mild, moderate, and severe, that also, independent of the imaging, can determine what happens to that patient in their treatment. And of course, for these symptoms, in the back of the mind, we must always have be thinking about what are other things this could be, particularly if the patient has um, aphasia or a unilateral weakness. We're going to be thinking about infarct. Um, infections can also happen in these patients. Press is also common in the elderly. And these are all diseases that might mimic the symptoms or the imaging features. Now, what about monitoring? So, you know, whenever possible, you also need to have consistency on that monitoring MRI. And if you can, make that something that can be, again, explicitly ordered. So in our practice, um, we actually have a specific MRI order for brain Alzheimer therapy. And that drives them to get, again, specific scanners, specific protocols. If your practice has the ability to do 3T for these patients consistently, that's considered the gold standard. But you also need to keep in mind patient-centered care. And this is one of the things that we've realized more as our experience with these treatments is going on is that these are patients who have early dementia and they're getting multiple infusions maybe every other week and they're getting multiple brain MRIs. So making trips to different places adds to confusion and inconsistency for the patients, can contribute to missed visits, and can also make it complicated for the radiologist if you're seeing a different scan every time. So if that patient is getting their infusion near their home, and you've identified a really good scanner in that area, and it happens to be 1.5T, and you can consistently get the same protocol on it, then that's perfectly acceptable to get that at 1.5T in order to get consistency. Because what you're looking for on these scans is change from visit to visit. Now, um, in our practice, we've streamlined this because we know if they're asymptomatic, we're looking for three findings, right? We're looking for our vasogenic edema on flare. We're looking for the hemorrhages on a T2 star or SWI. And then we're including diffusion to rule out another process like an infarct. And if you do those three sequences, and again, the protocols are downloadable from the ASNR, this is about 10 minutes. And this means you can squeeze these patients into almost any facility any day and keep them on track for their multiple brain MRIs that they're going to need. Now, if they're symptomatic, we actually do a, an enlarged protocol. And that's because if they're having symptoms, things like headache, dizziness, confusion, maybe GI symptoms, um, then you have a broad differential diagnosis. So you need a full brain MRI. And we actually would recommend contrast just as you would for any symptomatic patient, but make sure that embedded in that protocol are the consistent sequences that you're acquiring during the monitoring. So that when you compare, you've got the apples to apples. You can say, oh yes, this flare hyperintensity is new, or yes, this microhemorrhage is actually new. Um, and so if you put this together in that full protocol, you'll probably get um, closer to 25 minutes for that scan slot. Um, and obviously uh, really important um, for both asymptomatic and symptomatic, you call out and specifically report these findings for ARIA. And we're gonna be talking in a lot of detail coming up on how we make those measurements and how that gets categorized. Okay, the next recommendation is for scheduling the MRIs. So again, these patients, this is these medications are treated by infusion. So they're gonna be lined up for infusion centers. 
they'll probably be going to one infusion center again and again. As the radiologist in your group, that's kind of the point person for these protocols, I recommend that you map out, okay, here are the five infusion centers that we're gonna be using. Okay, these are the five MRI scanners closest to those infusion centers that are gonna be in the best proximity for this patient. And then what the neurologist can do is they're gonna schedule all these infusions months in advance. They can actually schedule all the MRIs at the same time so that the MRI is a day or two before the infusion and it's all on schedule. It really helps when people are ordering the MRIs if they give us as much detail as possible We've all had that experience, right? Where the, the, the order for the MRI might say like headache or something that doesn't, doesn't mean anything. We, we need to know as radiologists that they're on these therapies. Um, and then the other thing, this is something that we've encountered in our practice is in general, dementia protocols as being non-urgent, not time sensitive. But these patients actually have a treatment decision that may be happening within a day or so after that MRI. So let me just give you an actual example. Um, we had a patient who was flying in um, from Florida to come, come to St. Louis to get their therapy, coming back home. And so they scheduled the MRI to take place the afternoon before the infusion. The infusion was the next morning. They got the MRI at five o'clock at night. The infusion was scheduled for 10 a.m. Well, I can tell you with all the overnight ER cases, everything else happening, um, at the time of the infusion, they were still waiting for that MRI result. It caused a lot of anxiety and tension back and forth. So I would also suggest one thing we've learned is we actually have an order priority. You can bump it up just a little bit. We use it for patients like cancer patients with the same day appointment with their oncologist consider using that slightly elevated order priority if you have that available. And then um, finally, you know, we want to avoid having these patients go to the ER. We want to avoid having them go to urgent care. We really want to avoid them getting an MRI at a random location. And then we're trying to interpret somebody else's protocol in comparison to ours. So make sure for each of these patients with their imaging facility that you know who the managers are and you have a sense of how you're going to do an urgent add-on in advance so that if you need to work that in, you have a workflow in place ahead of time. Another thing that we can do in radiology to really help ourselves for that consistency is ordering guides. So this is just an example of an ordering guide that we've built within EPIC, which is our EMR. Um, basically for all of the orders, there's a secret thing called a synonym you can do. So I built a synonym for all of these orders and you can see these are the brain MRIs that we need for monitoring and baseline, but also things like the lumbar puncture someone might need for a diagnosis or an amyloid or tau pet or an FTG pet. They type dementia, they're gonna get all the orders that are specific for this group of people. And it makes it really easy when they call the reading room and they say, wait, how do I order the right MRI? I say, just type dementia. Um, you can also have web pages, right? With your ordering guides where you tell people, here's what to order or paper ordering guides. So our practices, almost all of us do this already because we're, we're, we are concerned about the coding. We want things to be coded correctly before they come in. Think about making a, an, an ordering guide specific to your dementia patients. And then this is the other thing um, to do is to really educate your group on how to recognize these patients um, when they come in. And this is a screenshot of, um, for our EMR, what a patient like this would look like. And you can see, um, we're gonna start on the bottom of the screen in red that baseline MRI. So right away, I can see brain volumetric. That tells me this is a patient who was getting a dementia workup. It might also say brain cognitive impairment. So that's that specific order. You can see this is a patient who also had an FDG PET along the way. They had a lumbar puncture along the way. These are all radiology services that we can offer this population. 
And then those screening MRIs for ARIA, you can see in green at the top, these show up as the brain Alzheimer therapy. And if it's without contrast, I can be pretty sure they were asymptomatic that day because I've educated my neurologist on what to order. Now, the other really important thing I want to show you is, um, and this is going to be site specific, but for us, this came up generically and I just wasn't aware of it, is right underneath the allergies on the far left of your screen. So right under allergies are the IV therapies that patients are on. Um, and so if they're on a drug, like in this case, lecanemab, it's going to show up right under the allergies. Now, why do we care about that? We care about that because they may be coming to us in the ER with stroke symptoms later. And it may be that you as the radiologist reading that stroke CT head may be the one to recognize that they're also on this therapy. And obviously giving um, an anticoagulant, antithrombolytic medication to somebody who might be having ARIA could be a very dangerous situation. So these are the things that we really want you to watch for in your medical record, whatever medical record you have, make sure you become familiar with how do the orders appear and how do I know somebody is on this therapy if it just comes through the stack. So these are some common questions that um, I've been asked a lot. So is 3T required? Again, if you have 3T capacity, then keeping somebody at 3T is ideal. That'll match the clinical trials. You're going to see the most microhemorrhages at every visit. If you are limited, restricted by capacity for 3T, or if potentially they're going to, to get their therapy out 50 miles away from your 3T scanner, you can easily set this up for 1.5T monitoring as well. You just have to make sure to, to set up the protocol correctly and use the correct protocol at every visit. Um, and that may be able to allow you to treat more patients, which may be a priority for your group. Another question is, um, is SWI required? So SWI and SWAN, we know are gonna be more sensitive than a GRE T2 star. Um, we've had a lot of debate in the ASNR and in the ACR, different groups about which, which one should we do. The clinical trials were using GRE T2 star. Um, my personal recommendation and what we're saying at the ASNR is you really want to see as many findings as you can and give that information to the clinician. So we're actually including both of these when we can, but not all of our scanners have that capability. And especially if someone might be going to an urgent care or somewhere else out in the community, they may not be getting all of that. So that's why we include both. It's a minimal time increment to include both of those. And then you're going to have the full information when you're doing that comparison to decide if the finding is new or not. Another question I get asked is, um, if somebody has siderosis, should we get a CTA? And the answer is no. The etiology of siderosis in ARIA is not a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so unless you have some other reason to suggest that someone has a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you do not need to work up ARIA with CT angiography. And then finally, another question I get a lot is, on the images, is there a difference between CAA and ARIA? Can we tell the difference just by looking at the images? Honestly, no. They look a lot alike. They probably have some underlying features, as Dr. Baracos has talked to us about that underlying pathophysiology of leaky vessels. Okay, some more common questions is, what if you need an urgent same-day symptomatic scan? We recommend that you, as a radiologist, work with neurology to establish workflows in advance so that these patients don't need to get extra ER visits for mild symptoms, um, but you need a pathway for them to be able to get that urgent MRI. Um, having your radiology managers, not just the radiologists, but our technical staff also involved will really help you a lot with making these care pathways um, work. 
Then finally, um, can CT substitute for MRI? So CT is not recommended to assess for ARIA. You're going to see vasogenic edema if it is moderate or severe, but you'll probably not see mild vasogenic edema or socal effusions, and you'll probably miss those microhemorrhages. Um, and particularly if this patient has presented to the ED, they got a CT, they're considering that they might have a stroke, we strongly urge you to consider getting that MRI to look for those microhemorrhages and siderosis, especially before any thrombolytic agents are administered. Now let's turn to the ARIA severity grading. Uh, Dr. Benzinger has beautifully outlined the important role our findings will play in the management and care of these patients. And literally, we do get those calls probably on a weekly basis where the infusion center is waiting for the results before they can proceed. So this really does make a difference. And when we make these findings, um, even if no one's waiting for the results, we need to close the loop on communication. Now, um, Touching briefly here, we're looking at, again, the division between ARIA-E and ARIA-H. Um, the idea here is we're having something leaking out of the vasculature. For E, it's going to be fluid. And if it leaks into the parenchyma, that will present as parenchymal hyperintensity, namely vasogenic edema. If it's leaking into the leptomeninges, that will present as a sulcal effusion. For the ARIA-H, if we have RBCs leaking out into the parenchyma, it will present as a lobar microhemorrhage. And if it's leaking into the leptomeninges, it will present as a focus of superficial siderosis. So there, depending on what leaks out and where it leaks, we have the different characterizations of the ARIA-E and ARIA-H. Now, here's the severity scale um, that is on every package insert. So if there's any questions, it's going to be right on the package insert of the uh, the drug. Now, it looks a little bit daunting, but the key feature here is we basically break it into units of five. So let's start off with the ARIA-E. If you have a zone of abnormality that's less than five centimeters, it's called mild. If it's between five and 10, it's moderate. And if it's more than 10, it's severe. So pretty straightforward cutoff margins. The most important thing here is Dr. Benzinger outlined that we're looking for change. Now, sometimes we've shown you some examples that are pretty dramatic. Other times, this ARIA-E can be very subtle. It'll present without any T2 hyperintensity necessarily, but simply a gyral swelling and a sulcal effacement. And that's why change is key. And that's why it's imperative that we have access to the baseline scan. We're looking for interval change. Now, when we make these measurements, we are measuring the entire zone of change. So if you were to have a parenchymal area of T2 hyperintensity, you just don't stop at the margins. You have to look at the contiguous sulci and see if those have been effaced or if there's a mild effusion. Long story short, if it's less than five centimeters, mild, between five and 10 moderate, and more than 10 severe. Now, if there's multiplicity separated in space, so if you have two separate zones of involvement, and let's say they're both small, well, that still throws you into the moderate. So you'll see that as soon as you have multiplicity, you go into moderate. And then, of course, severe can have multiplicity as well, but you're looking at greater than 10 centimeters. Now, let's look at the microhemorrhages. Important to understand this severity scale is referring to incident microhemorrhages. That means at baseline, the patient could have had up to four and be considered for treatment. So they may have four. Here, we're not measuring the total number. We are measuring the new ones since baseline. So if someone had four at baseline and they get four more, that would be considered mild with a total of eight. So again, um, this is making reference to only the new micros since the patient has begun treatment. Finally, with siderosis, we break it down into zones of involvement. If there's one zone, it's uh, mild. If there are two separate zones, they need to be focally separate. Sometimes you'll have one zone where there's some involvement on one sulcus, and then it'll be right on the other side of the other sulcus, and it appears separate, but that would be considered one general zone. Um, and then if there's more than two separate zones, that goes into severe. 
And this information is critical um, for the clinicians to know. Am I dealing with mild, moderate, severe? Because again, most of these patients will be asymptomatic, and this information will play an important role as to what will happen with dosing. So here's some uh, brief examples of the grading scale. On the top left, we have primarily a sulcal effusion. It's measuring less than five centimeters, including adjacent areas of, of sulcal effacement. Um, 1B is another area which is more parenchymal in nature in the anterior aspect of the right temporal lobe. Um, in the 1C, we have a larger zone. And again, when you start getting a zone this big, and you're going to make a difference between moderate and severe, that cutoff of five centimeters, um, that can be very important because in some trials, they will treat through moderate asymptomatic, although most of the time they won't. But it's important to realize that if someone has some significant aria, the last thing they need is more of the drug that's giving them these brain changes. So you want to be careful when you measure to realize that you're doing a three-dimensional measurement as well. So as, for example, the, the fourth example on the top, um, looking at that left temporal lobe, you're going to measure all the way from the most anterior tip of that brain parenchyma all the way back to that posterior occipital area because there's going to be some of those sulci effaced so that will be considered um, an abnormality so you want to make that complete measurement and remember um, you're just not doing it in a single plane you may want to use a reconstruction because if this extends more cephalad along the parietal region that could easily exceed 10 centimeters now let's take a look at the lower graph where we're looking at a series of microhemes. On the bottom, we see in red, we're pointing to the lobar microhemorrhages. And as radiologists, we want to differentiate these microhemes from normal vasculature. And I know it, it seems pretty straightforward, but typically in our routine practice, we're not counting microhemes. In this setting, counting them is important, but we want to be accurate. We're not looking for any dot that could be a microheme, such as vasculature. So the blue arrows are pointing to some obvious vessels, and there's some basic concepts of how we would differentiate a vessel from something within the parenchyma. And it's the type of thing, as you do it more and more, it becomes more straightforward. Now, looking at the 2B example, uh, we can see in the left posterior occipital region, there's an area of vasogenic edema, but on this GRE T2 star image, we can see numerous small, subtle lobar microhemorrhages that have developed. Now, it turns out that quite a number of them were present on numerous contiguous slices, and they exceeded 10 new microhemorrhages since baseline. As a result, this would be characterized as severe. Again, the blue arrows are pointing to to regions that are hypo intensities, but they're in fact consistent with vasculature. And you can make that differentiation obviously by looking at contiguous slices or looking at your routine T2 to establish is that a vessel or is it truly a parenchymal lobar microhemorrhage. Now turning to examples of superficial siderosis, in example 2C, we have an area of a sulcal focus of siderosis in the right frontal region. This would be a single area characterized as mild since it's one area. Um, on the next example, this patient actually had several um, different areas of superficial siderosis. We can see bifrontal. There's also another um, region separate in the parietal area that gave us three zones. So this was characterized as severe. And we're also kind of outlining in, in the blue circle, more interiorly, the calcification of the falx, which could be a mimic. So again, I think the more we do this as radiologists, the more straightforward differentiating a vessel from a lobar microhemorrhage or superficial siderosis from vasculature or other findings that will become more straightforward. Now, here's a nice example of the same patient over time. On the top row, we have the T2 flare. On the bottom row, we have the GRE um, or the GRE T2 star. What we're seeing is we're starting off with baseline scan on the far left. This patient had no significant signal abnormality on T2 flare, no hemosiderin abnormalities. Um, the patient then underwent a series of dosing. Remember, these patients will undergo IV infusion typically at a monthly interval. And this patient came for their routine post-titration period scan. So we're looking at the third one from the left at the top, and we see the red, arrow, red arrows are pointing to new areas 
of T2 hyperintensity, one kind of in the mid right temporal lobe and another one in the occipital pole. And you can compare to baseline and see those are new findings consistent with ARIA-E. Subsequently, if we take a look at the corresponding GRE-T2 star below, we can see that some microhemorrhages have appeared in the brain parenchyma as well. And sometimes the microhemorrhage can be your tip to look more carefully for subtle areas of aria, since in about 50% of circumstances, you'll have co-occurrence of aria-E and aria-H with, certain, with certain agents. Now, what's interesting here is, once the aria was detected, the patient had a serial follow-up, and on the serial follow-up, we can see that there is a decrease in the amount of aria-E. So the temporal lobe is improving, also some improvement in the occipital region. However, the patient continued to develop additional microhemorrhages. Then finally, on the final image, we have resolution of aria-E, and the patient has stability in the microhemorrhages. So you can have kind of a fluctuating situation where the aria is aria E is getting worse and then better, and the aria H can actually progress. But if treatment is suspended, we are looking for complete resolution of the aria E and stability of the aria H before continuing on with treatment if the patient's asymptomatic. Um, and of course, we're saying stability of the RAH because remember, the hemosiderin depositions are an indelible marking of the brain, kind of like a tattooing, and they typically will not reverse. So we're simply looking for stability in that regard. Now, what are some tips for tracking the microhemorrhages? Now, specifically when using susceptibility-weighted imaging, um, you may see a fair number of microhemes, and counting can be tricky. So, for example, we showed an example earlier of more than 10 microhemes, and you're going to be following those over time. So, I like the idea of marking each of these. You can use a marker um, and annotate them, and it helps with the counting, because remember, actually seeing and knowing your numbers are going to be critical. Now, one important point is we are counting low bar microhemorrhages. We're not concerned about the mineralization of the deep gray matter structures or um, vas um, vascular related uh, changes that might be seen in the basal ganglia. We're looking specifically for low bar microhemorrhages uh, or microhemorrhages that may develop within the thalamus or brainstem. Now, in terms of reporting, Dr. Benzinger will go into that in detail. Um, it's quite clear that depending on what we find, uh, if it's mild as opposed to moderate or severe, we have to make sure that this information is communicated in a timely fashion with closed loop technique to ensure this information is, makes it to the clinicians who are managing these patients and caring for them. Thank you. Now we're going to talk in a little more detail about how we as radiologists and neuroradiologists can best partner and communicate with our referring clinicians in order to improve care for these patients with early stage Alzheimer's disease. First of all, communication is key, not just our reports, but day-to-day -day communication and meetings. One suggestion is actually to set up something akin to a tumor board or a multidisciplinary meeting when the team can meet as a group to talk about new and existing patients and considerations. For example, a patient who has five microhemorrhages but really wants to go on therapy, a patient who's APOE44, patient who has a pacemaker, all kinds of considerations that could impact the workflows both on the neurology and the radiology side can be discussed. We've already talked about how important it is to have a report that's clear and communicates the key finding and using a standardized reporting template can really help you make that communication efficient. Um, standard reporting, not just for the baseline, but also for the follow-up scans. And finally, communication with a phone call. I actually recommend, um, as does the ASNR, is that all cases of ARIA need a phone call. Now, if it's mild, it might be that your administrative assistant calls a nurse just to get that out there. Definitely, though, moderate or severe radiographic ARIA 
can change that patient's treatment plan short term. And we really do recommend a physician to physician conversation to talk about that, to make sure that that result is communicated. Um, we also ask the referring physicians to help us as radiologists by including this history on the orders. So if we don't know they're on therapy, we may not um, even be going down the right line of thinking and also um, making sure we have all those phone numbers, the backline numbers, the cell phone numbers, so that if we're calling a result, we know how to do it quickly. So there are reporting templates available on the ASNR website. You can download these. These can help you incorporate these um, into your practice if you're interested. They'll also be able, uh, you'll also be able to download these through practice aids related to this peer view educational activity. And if you build these in, it can actually help you accurately transfer this information. This is just a reminder that the severity score, um, I love the, the rules of five Dr. Barakos gave us, um, but it can be hard when you're reading a lot of cases in the reading room, patients with different diagnoses, different scoring systems, it can be hard to remember it. And this is where a template can help you. Just to read it again, these key features are findings that we think would be CAA, macro hemorrhages, micros, we need to count them, siderosis, we need to count it, the vasogenic edema, we need to measure it. And remember, um, as Dr. Barakos has said, to include all the areas that are continuously abnormal, that may have extend to a sulcal effusion, for example. And then on that baseline, in particular, other reasons someone might have a risk of hemorrhage, such as an aneurysm, vascular malformation, infarcts, extensive white matter disease, or other diseases that may temporal dementia, maybe a meningioma or other type of brain tumor or other finding. Obviously, we need to report not just on ARIA, but on everything else we normally review as a radiologist. Um, and so obviously, we'll use our standard reports. We need to talk specifically about the field strength and the techniques since moving around can change the way we see these findings. And then when we describe these findings, we can actually build these into our templates to make it easy. And we're going to show you a quick video clip of how this can work in PowerScribe. This is an example of the reporting template that we have built in PowerScribe. The key features are the use of the pick list, that's called pick list choices. You can think of this as multiple choice answers. And I wanna show you how this works. If I come to the impression of this report, the default is no evidence of current aria E. However, my choices are mild, moderate, or severe. If I click on mild, you can see the impression will change to findings concerning for mild radiographic aria E. And it includes the definition, flare hyperintensity confined to sulcus and or cortex, subcortex, white matter in one location less than five centimeters. We do recommend you use the next tab to use free text. As you can do it like this. As described above, we can see there are areas of flare hyperintensity in the right frontal lobe, which are new. And that'll insert your text the way you normally use PowerScribe. Similarly, if you go to the next line, we've called out as a separate line, the micro hemorrhages, since the FDA has asked us to record ARIA H micro hemorrhages separately. And their choices are none, less than five, five to nine, or greater than 10. And similar to the above, if you click on it, it's going to go ahead and pre-fill it. So if I had a patient with more than 10 new micro hemorrhages, I could click more than 10, and then you'll see concerning for severe aria H due to the presence of more than 10 new incident microhemorrhages. And again, you can use the next pick box to then free text and dictate the details. And then finally, since siderosis is separately called out, you can do the same thing with that. If you have no areas, no new areas, one or two. So let's, let's pretend this patient had two new areas of siderosis. It's gonna automatically pick this up and say moderate ARIA-H. 
So this can greatly simplify the workflow for the radiologist. You don't have to memorize that table. You have it built into your report. And then of course, um, most importantly, when you do have findings of ARIA, we do recommend you include in your report that statement about who you called, who you gave that result to, because we know that's going to impact the patient care. There are also some quantitative tools. Um, many vendors now have these in progress, including um, some are under FDA review that can really help you with um, identifying these findings and tracking them sequentially. And there are also some CPT codes available that may help with reimbursement for these. We expect this is going to be a growing area in the future and so something you may want to pay attention to. Now let's take a moment to look at the ARIA management algorithm. Obviously this is done clinically, uh, but just to show you how our input plays an important role in the treatment of these patients. So starting off with the first line, the baseline MRI is obtained to make sure the patient is an appropriate candidate. So we want to screen for low bar microhemorrhages, um, the superficial cirrhosis, and other disease conditions that may not be expected. Now, once the patient is undergoing treatment, they will have these monitoring MRIs. It's key to know whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic when you detect ARIA. If the patient is, sim is symptomatic, the drug will be held regardless of the nature of the ARIA. So that's a key point. If the patient has new symptoms, the drug will be held. And of course, knowing what the ARIA status is will be important. The drug will not be resumed until those symptoms resolve, as well as until the ARIA-E resolves and the ARIA-H has stabilized. And as long as it, it has not been severe ARIA or, or severe symptoms, the patient can resume therapy. In contrast, on the right side of the scale, if we find that a patient has ARIA, but they're asymptomatic, then of course, that's where the grading scale we've been discussing comes into play. Typically, if it's moderate or severe, the patient will undergo dose suspension. If it's mild, we call it being dosed through. The patient will continue with um, therapy. And continued serial imaging is performed on a monthly basis at a minimum to see what the ARI is doing. Of course, if symptomatology worsens at any point in time, just like in clinical practice, you would simply perform additional MR imaging. And finally, there are some factors that can lead to the total suspension of further administration of drug as listed below. Now, in terms of the management of severe symptomatic cases of ARIA, um, basically the key feature is remove offending agents. So obviously the patient will undergo dose suspension. Um, we do have other tools that can be used, such as the use of steroids, and of course, looking very carefully for um, epileptiform activity because anti-epileptics can be an important tool as well. Finally, resuming treatment after resolution of ARIA. As we've outlined in most cases, patient will resume on therapy once they've met specific criteria. They don't have any of the exclusion criteria um, and that the ARIA-E has resolved, symptoms have resolved, and the ARIA-H has stabilized. Now, let's start off with a case example. This will be a polling example. We have a 72-year-old patient who's on an anti-amyloid therapy, and they're presenting for routine monitoring scan. So they're asymptomatic. On the far left, we have our T2 flare. And we've circled a finding that we have noted is new when compared to the baseline scan. And you can see, looking at the scan, if you were asked, is there a new spot on this scan. If you don't have a baseline, you wouldn't be able to tell which of those spots then differentiate ARIA E potentially from a zone of mic from microangiopathic senescent change. So having a comparison scan with baseline, we see we find a new area of bright signal on T2 flare. Now the corresponding GRE susceptibility weighted scan shows a concomitant focus of signal abnormality of hypointensity in keeping with the microheme in that area. Then we have the diffusion weighted scan that shows no corresponding restricted diffusion. And finally, with the administration of gadolinium, there was no abnormal contrast enhancement. So this is the question. We have a new focus on T2 flare, corresponding area of microheme 
no restricted diffusion, and no contrast enhancement. So our question is, what is this? One, I'm not sure. Two, aria. Three, infarct. Four, brain met. Number five, infection. Also, polling question number two. What is the type and severity of this finding if we believe it's aria? Again, number one, I'm not sure. Number two, this would be mild aria E. Number three, this represents mild aria H. Number four, this is both mild aria E and mild aria H. And number five, severe aria. So these findings are absolutely consistent with aria E and aria H, specifically mild aria E and aria H. Remember, aria does not demonstrate associated restricted diffusion, so that's an important point. And number two, does not show associated contrast enhancement. Now, I, I do know that rarely a MET, a very small MET, can show up in a very similar fashion where you'll just see it on the susceptibility weighted scan without associated contrast enhancement. That's pretty unusual, but in rare cases, you can see that. But this is a case on our, this is a discussion and lecture on ARIA. So this was an example of ARIA E and ARIA H mild format. All right, so let's take it another case. So this is also a patient who's on monoclonal antibody therapy. This patient actually presented for an unscheduled MRI, um, complaining of a headache. And as you can see, we have findings on flare in the bilateral occipital lobes, both some white matter vasogenic edema, as well as a sulcal effusion. We have findings on our susceptibility sequence that looks like um, maybe some siderosis and micros and nothing on diffusion. So the question is for you, um, what is it? I'm not sure. It's aria, it's an infarct, it's a braid met or an infection. Next question is what is the type and severity? And again, I'm not sure. It's a moderate E, a moderate H, a moderate E and H or severe. So let's go over this case. Um, in this case, we have the flare hyperintensities. They're um, more than one site. So we've got bilateral occipital, that bumps it to moderate. The next question is, um, what about the H? So in this case, we've got these areas of superficial siderosis. We see there are two areas, right occipital and left. Um, and so that bumps it also to moderate. Common question I get is, if I've got two moderates, does that make it severe? No, we don't add them up across the categories. You're going to put a separate, I recommend a separate impression line for each of these. Moderate aria E, say where it is. Moderate aria H, siderosis, say where it is. And then whatever you have for the micros as well. In our next case, we have a 76-year-old patient who actually presents with a headache. And this patient is on an anti-amyloid agent. We're starting on the far left on our T2 flare. We can see numerous areas of T2 hyperintensity. And when compared to baseline, this represents numerous areas of change, uh, as well as some generalized cerebral swelling with sulcal effacement throughout. We take a look at the corresponding GRE, susceptibility weighted scan, and we see no significant blood degradation products, so no hemosiderin. And finally, we have the diffusion weighted scan. And on this diffusion weighted scan, we see no significant restricted diffusion. And on top of it, the patient received gadolinium and there was no abnormal contrast enhancement. So we have T2 changes, no changes on the susceptibility weighted scan, no restricted diffusion, and no contrast enhancement. Polling question, what is this? One, I'm not sure. Number two, aria. Number three, infarct. Number four, brain met. Number five, infection. Well, let's take a look at this case. 
We see that there's no restricted diffusion for these large areas of signal abnormalities, so that would rule out an ischemic process or stroke. Um, we also see no abnormal contrast enhancement. Typically with these areas of vasogenic edema, we might expect a focus, the inciting focus of abnormal enhancement, and there is none. So as a result, this would be a characteristic finding of ARIA. Next polling question for this case, what is the type and severity of this ARIA? We have the baseline scan on the left, and then we have the follow-up scan on the right, and we've put some measurements on the scan. Number one, I'm not sure. Number two, moderate aria E. Number three, moderate aria H. Number four, moderate aria E and severe aria H and severe aria E. Well, let's look at this case. Remember, when measuring for aria E, you want to include all sulcal effusions as well as any sulcal effacement because this represents an edematous process. So you can see when comparing to baseline, really the entire brain is, is swollen and edematous. So although we've marked the areas of T2 hyperintensity within the parenchyma, that doesn't constitute your measurement. You must go all the way to contiguous normal parenchyma and you need to do that in three dimensions. And remember at the end of the day, so this would be a severe example of RAE. Remember at the end of the day, you're not doing anyone favors by under measuring aria. A patient like this, the last thing they need is more drug. That's how you get into trouble. So um, it's key, make the appropriate measurements, relay that information to your clinician. So this would be an example of severe aria E. And at the same time, we are not seeing any hemosiderin products. So this would not represent a case of concomitant aria H. Okay, here's another patient presenting with confusion. Um, in this case, the patient's in the ER. We don't know if they're on therapy or not, but we see the flare has this edema. We see there's a microhemorrhage within it. We've just been to a seminar on Alzheimer's and ARIA. This must be ARIA, except on diffusion, there's also restricted diffusion in that same area. So what is this? Not sure, aria, infarct, brain met, or infection. So hopefully we didn't fool you, even though it's a, a seminar on aria, this is actually a patient with an infarct. And it's gonna be really important. This is why we include diffusion in the core sequences for this protocol. So we include flare, some kind of susceptibility, and diffusion, um, because these are going to be the most important um, immediate differential diagnoses to make. Now, why is this so important? Um, because patients who are on anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies can present with stroke-like symptoms or due to their memory impairment, they may not be able to really communicate their symptoms well enough for someone to know quickly if they're having a stroke. It's important to us as radiologists to, to keep in mind this differential and consideration. And unfortunately, um, there's at least one published death post-marketing with one of the drugs of a patient who presented to the emergency department um, and received thrombolytics and unfortunately did die. So really, really important as radiologists and neuroradiologists reading those acute hyperacute stroke head CTs in the ER to keep in mind this therapy on our differential diagnosis and to um, urge for consideration of an MRI um, to confirm an infarct before any thrombolytics are given in a patient on this medication um, and obviously a very careful um, informed consent discussion would have to happen between neurology and that family in the treatment planning. Here's our next case. We have a 68 year old patient who's receiving anti-amyloid therapy and they're coming in for a routine surveillance or monitoring scan. On the far left, we have our T2 flare showing a new area of subcortical signal abnormality when compared to baseline. Additionally, we see when compared to baseline GRE scan, there is a focus of new lobar 
microhemorrhage. And this patient received gadolinium, and we can see an associated focus of contrast enhancement corresponding to this finding. The polling question, what is this? Number one, I'm not sure. Number two, aria. Number three, infarct. Number four, brain met. Number five, infection. So let's take a look at this case. The giveaway, of course, is the administration of gadolinium showing associated contrast enhancement. So this would make this characteristic for a metastatic focus. Um, and again, to reiterate that aria E and aria H do not demonstrate associated contrast enhancement. Aria E is a vasogenic process, not cytotoxic, so you don't expect signal abnormality on the diffusion-weighted scan either. Now, let's take a look at some examples of ARIA mimics. These are potential interpretation pitfalls. And the first three images, what we're looking at, are the same patient on different scanners. So slide A is at baseline, and follow-up B is on two different types of machine. Now, this patient had no ARIA E. However, simply the manner in which the brain signal manifests on a different protocol on a different machine may be subtly different from system to system. And this may lead us to believe that those changes are in fact the result of RAE, when in fact it's simply due to a different scanning protocol or a different machine. This is why, as Dr. Benzinger highlighted earlier, it's important to try and get consistent imaging and let's say, for example, have the patient make it to the same imaging center every time, affording us the best opportunity of comparing apples to apples. Now, example C is simply oxygen supplementation, which as you know, can lead to uh, T2 flare hyperintensities overlying the convexities and the uh, sulci. Example number D, is poor water suppression. The image on left is a standard T2 flare, and the image on the right is the same patient with a finding that could be misconstrued as a sulcal effusion, when in fact this was incomplete water suppression. So that's why you want to have um, consistent, reliable imaging protocols. And finally, example E is one we're all familiar with. When you can have susceptibility effect, arising from the region of the mastoid, typically due to something such as hearing aid. And that blooming effect that you can see on the GRE, the last image, will bloom into the T2 flare, giving you a hyperintensity, misleading one into thinking that there's RAE, when in fact the patient simply failed to remove the hearing aid. All right. So... Thank you so much for your attention today. Just to reiterate some of the key features we've talked about, one is that if you establish some standardized imaging protocols, a standard ordering process, and standard reporting ahead of time, this can greatly streamline the workflow. In addition, if you have the ability to set up multidisciplinary meetings with your referring clinicians, neurologists, other dimension specialists, sort of like a tumor board, that can really help you adapt and understand how to best treat this population going forward. We do recommend that you think about designating a point person in your practice, a neuroradiologist who could be the expert within your group as that go-to person for questions about reading a scan with ARIA or which protocol or procedure to follow and can also kind of feel those questions from neurology for you. We do recommend that you are extra cautious whenever you're reading ER scans on stroke cases that you think about whether or not they might be on one of these anti-amyloid therapies. And if they are, how important it is to consider a brain MRI to look for ARIA and or confirm a real infarct as that can dramatically change what treatment decisions are made for that patient especially given the high risk of hemorrhage in the setting of these medications when they're given antithrombolytics. Finally, um, don't forget to download the reporting templates and other practice aids that we've um, included here for you on the PeerView platform. So just um, to say thanks again, please visit peerview.com to submit your post-test evaluation, download the slides, the practice aids, and watch for our online activity in coming weeks. So thank you again from both of us. This has been a wonderful opportunity to interact with you.